We are in a series of programs on Experience Hope called How to Live. And during this How to Live series, we're looking at some of the great issues of the Christian life, very, very practical issues. Our topic today is handling temptation. I was counseling with Bill. Bill was a Christian, but he was really struggling a great deal with a particular addictive habit that he couldn't give up. At least he didn't think he could give it up. It was smoking. He had smoked for about 15 years. He was a man in his late 20s, started smoking in his early teens. And as we talked together over a series of weeks, Bill came to the place where he said, yes, I do want to give up smoking. And so one day as I talked to him, I invited him to get all of his cigarettes, bring them into the uh, room that we were sitting in and put them on the floor. And we read some passages from the Bible. I shared with him the importance of, as he quit smoking, to get rid of the tobacco. I shared with him the importance of drinking water and taking a walk and went through the various physical aspects of quitting smoking. We knelt down to pray, and I suggested that he pray and then I pray. And Bill began to pray a prayer something like this. Dear Lord, you know how weak I am. You know it's impossible for me to give up smoking, O oh Lord. You know that, that, that I've smoked for so long. You know that nicotine is in every one of my uh, cells and nerves and tissues. You know how I crave for a smoke. And he went on and on and on in that negative way of praying. About halfway through the man's prayer, I couldn't take it anymore. So I opened my eyes and I shook Bill. And I said, Bill, you're going to be worse after your prayer than you were before. You know why I told him that? Stay tuned. And right after this song by the Emmanuel Quartet, he was there all the time. I'll tell you why I told Bill what I told him and how to handle temptation. He was there I was trying to blame all my ills on this world I was in. Surface relationships used me till I was done in. And all the time someone was waiting. was there. 
Why did I stop Bill in the middle of his prayer? Why didn't I let him go on? Bill's negative prayer was reinforcing in his own mind his weakness. There's a law of the mind that says expression deepens impression. In other words, the more we express negative thoughts and feelings, the more we express the fact that we're weak, the more we talk about that, the more we talk about the fact that we can't overcome, the more we talk about Satan's power, the less capable we are of receiving God's power by faith. It was only as Bill directed his attention from his weakness to God's strength. It was only as he directed his attention from his frailty to God's enduring might. It was only as he directed his, temptation, his, his direction in his mind from the temptations that were gripping him to the power of the living God that he was able, able to get victory. How do you handle temptation in your life? You know, somebody said, I can resist anything except temptation. But how do you handle temptation? The Bible helps us to understand how to deal with the temptations that come to us in life. Now, the first thing that's important to understand is this. Satan is the originator of all of our temptations. There are times that people say, well, why is God tempting me in this? God is not tempting you in it at all. God's not tempting you. That is not God's way of dealing with us. In fact, James chapter 1 makes that very, very plain. God's not the source of temptation. God is not the originator of temptation. Now, sometimes God will test us, but a test and a temptation are different things. What's a temptation? A temptation is an enticement to evil. A test is a circumstance that God allows to come into our life to increase our faith. But a temptation is an enticement to evil. And here's what the Bible says, James chapter 1, verse 12, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then... When desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. Now, notice the principle here. The Bible says, let no one say that when I'm tempted, I'm tempted of God. Why not? Because God does not entice us to evil. God is not there dangling before us enticements to anger and bitterness and resentment and lust 
God is not there uh, with the smoker who's trying to quit smoking, dangling cigarettes before their eyes to try to entice them to smoke again. God is not there waving some bottle of whiskey or beer before somebody who wants to overcome alcohol or drugs. God is not there leading us to watch some lustful television program. That's not God. Our temptations to criticize, our temptations for lust, our temptations for anger, our temptations to indulge these bodies of ours, those temptations come from another source other than God. They come from the evil one. And once I recognize that my temptations are coming from the evil one, once I identify the source of them, that goes a long way in helping me overcome those temptations. For example, if I feel a craving for a certain article of diet that I know is harmful or destructive to my health, and I say, this is not God leading me to have this craving. If I'm flipping the dial on the television and I see some program that I know is not in harmony with God's will, but I find myself lingering and immediately it can click in my brain, this is not God that is leading me in this direction. This is the devil to entice me. It's the devil to put me in bondage. God wants to set me free. When you deal with temptations, there's a second thing that's incredibly important to understand. Whatever the temptation is, God's stronger. Whatever the enticement is, God is stronger. God will never allow you to be tempted above what you, with his strength, with what you can bear. You can handle it through his strength. You can handle it by his power. God's power is greater than all of the temptations that we ever will have to face. The Bible makes that plain in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. And the Bible says this, no temptation has taken you except is common to man. In other words, every temptation you face, someone else has faced, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So every temptation we face, others have faced. And whatever temptation we face, Jesus will enable us to overcome that temptation through his strength and by his power, because his power is greater than the temptation. For example, if you have a craving to indulge appetite, if you have a craving for tobacco, for drugs, for alcohol, if there's some lustful physical craving, and your craving is this big, God's power is this big. If your craving is this big, God's power is this big. Whatever your craving is, whatever your desire is, whatever the temptation is, Jesus is greater than that temptation. Often when I'm helping people with some physical habit in their life, I ask them this question. What is greater, the power of temptation or the power of God? It kind of reminds me of a man who was quitting smoking once, and uh, he tried to quit smoking, was having a real difficult time, so he was going on a trip. And this trip required him to drive all day from California through the Arizona desert on his way to New Mexico. And he said to his wife, you know, this is a good day for me to stop. I'm going to be driving all alone in the car, and what I'll do is I'll just simply drive along, and uh, as I drive along in my car, I won't bring any cigarettes with me. So when I get my craving, I'll be out in the desert, no place I can buy them, and I will uh, drive, and, and, I'll, and I'll have at least one day that's smoke-free. And so he and his wife, uh, who, his wife really wanted him to quit smoking, and they prayed about it, and he said, Lord, give me the strength today. I, I have never gone a whole day without smoking. I smoke about two packs a day, but I'm not bringing any cigarettes with me. I'm driving in the car. I'll be driving through the desert, and I'll be okay. As he was driving along, he got a craving, and he was about a couple hours out in the desert by this time, and he got a craving, and the craving got worse and worse and worse and worse, and he said, I just can't handle this. I just can't handle this. And as he was driving down the road with an eye on the road, holding the wheel, he kind of looked over at the glove compartment. He said, I know I got at least a pack in there. And so with one eye on the road and the other eye on the glove compartment, he popped open the glove compartment, began to fiddle around, no cigarettes. By now, the craving is really intense. And he's saying, wait a minute, I know I have some in my, in my briefcase, and that's sitting on the passenger side seat. I'm alone. He began to feel around it, nothing. Stopped his car, and he said, I know. I always keep a few extra cigarettes for an emergency like this. I can't handle this. And he ran to the back of his car. By now, the 
door of the driver's side was left open. By now, his uh, glove compartment was open. By now, there was stuff all over the front seat. By now, he was having this really tremendous nicotine fit or attack. Opens the trunk of his car, throws it open, takes clothes out of his suitcase, and begins to strew them all over the desert floor, throwing in one this way, this way. He couldn't handle this craving. Couldn't find cigarettes. He said, wait a minute, I know, I know. Here, here in my, in, my, in my suit coat pocket, there's a little bit of nicotine. And so he began to pull out, inside out, his suit coat pocket. He went going like this. And all of a sudden it hit him. Here I am, in the middle of the Arizona desert, with my clothes strewn all over the ground sucking on the inside of my jacket. He said, this is absolutely crazy. Cigarettes have become the all-powerful source in my life. I quit. See, once you know that whatever temptation you have, you've been dominated by that temptation. It's been the controlling force of your life, whether it's alcohol, tobacco, whether it's a temper, whether it's bitterness, whatever that thing is, whether it's appetite out of control, whether it's drugs, it has become the dominating force of your life. And once you understand that Jesus Christ has come to break that bondage, that Jesus is stronger than that thing that controls you, he's stronger than that thing that dominates you, because Jesus faced every temptation that we ever have to face. Jesus faced every temptation common to us. But the interesting thing is, he faced it in much greater degree than we will, and he overcame. Now you say, that's very difficult for me to understand. How could Jesus face every temptation that is common to us? I don't quite understand that. I mean, really now, Jesus never faced the temptation to shoot heroin in his veins, did he? Jesus never faced the temptation that a woman does whose husband has left her for somebody else. Jesus never faced uh, the temptation to become discouraged because he had cancer. How can we say that Jesus faced every temptation that we ever face? Well, take this one about physical addictions, alcohol, tobacco, drugs, appetite. Jesus fasted for 40 days in the wilderness. And when he fasted for that 40-day period, the cravings that he had for food were far greater than the cravings you ever have for anything, whether it's alcohol, tobacco, unclean foods, whether it is drugs, whatever it is. The cravings Jesus had were far greater than any cravings that you ever have for whatever you have that craving for. If your appetite is out of control, Jesus' cravings were greater than the craving for drugs, the craving for heroin, whatever they are. If you are going through loneliness, think of his loneliness on the cross. He may never have been divorced, but he was betrayed by Judas. You see, physical pain. Uh, think of the physical pain that Jesus had when the nails were driven through his hands. Whatever physical pain you have, he had. So we, when we face temptation, have a Savior that not only has gone through it for us, but who understands how we feel in every circumstance of our lives. This is what the book of Hebrews says, for example. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 and 16. Do you see in verse 16 where it says, let us therefore come boldly? Some translations are say confidently. Let us come confidently to the throne of grace. The New Testament is written in the Greek language, and the Greek word for confidently or boldly there is the word parsia, which means complete, total, absolute confidence. We can come to Jesus with complete, with total, with absolute confidence that he's not the originator of temptation. We can come with complete, total, absolute confidence that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, that he faced everything that we have to face in our lives, and that he gives to us victory over temptation through Jesus' power. The victory over temptation 
is yours. You see, that's what I told Bill when I shook him when we were praying together. I said, Bill, your problem is that you are looking at your weakness. Your problem is that you're looking at your frailty. Your problem is that you are looking at how long you've been smoking, and you're looking at the strength of the cigarette. Unless you look at Jesus, you'll never overcome. Because when I look at myself, my trouble grows. But when I look at Jesus, my trouble goes. When I look at Jesus, my life changes. I have a different perception. And it is faith that reaches out to trust Jesus that he can do for me which I, that which I could never do for myself. I have seen thousands of people caught in the grip of terrible temptations in their lives. But when they understand by faith that they reach out and receive Christ's power in their lives, it changes them, it transforms them. You say, Mark, is it that simple? My will is the power of faculty that's the faculty of choice. So I make a conscious choice through faith, believing in God's power, to trust Him to do in me what I can never do in myself. You say, is, that, is it that simple? Well, maybe I illustrate it this way. What if all the lights in this studio went out? And what if this studio were absolutely pitch black and every light in the studio went out? So I say to my friend Tim, who's on one of the cameras, look, I got to get home, but I don't know the way. The lights are all out. Let's get a shovel. And we're going to shovel the darkness out. Now Tim says, Mark, that's a pretty good idea. So we get a shovel, like you shovel snow, we're shoveling. Not dark, it's not going anywhere. Our producer, Joe, becomes concerned. He hasn't seen us for about an hour, and I'm trying to get out of here. It's all dark. And Joe comes in. And I say, Joe, thanks for coming in. We're going to push the darkness out. So after Tim and I tried to shovel the darkness for an hour or two, Joe and I are now pushing, pushing, pushing with Tim, and no darkness comes out. My wife hasn't seen me for the last four or five hours. She knows I'm shooting the television program today, so she comes to the studio. And she says, guys, what are you doing? There is a little switch on the wall. Take your finger, Mark, and throw the switch. And I throw the switch and light comes on. It isn't the act of the finger that creates the light. It is the connection of the power the connection of the power to the electrical plant that produces light. Tim and I could try to shovel the darkness. With all our human effort, nothing happens. Joe and Tim and I can try to push the darkness out. Nothing happens. When we throw the switch connected to the power, light comes on. When I choose by faith to receive the power of the living God into my life, victory comes. That's what the Bible means in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. 1 John 5, verse 4, victory over temptation comes by faith, by trust, by believing his power is greater than my weakness. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, the Bible says, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our what? Even our faith. You want to overcome the temptations of your life? Reach out by faith and receive the power of the living God into your life. Now, there's one more thing. To maintain victory over temptation, it's necessary to avoid those specific places, pleasures, habits, or things which are the source of temptation. If you know that your problem is alcohol, why are you going down there to the nightclub? If you know your problem is lust, why are you going to that video store buying those pictures? The only way to be victorious in your life is first recognize the source of temptation comes from Satan. Secondly, recognize that God's power is greater than Satan's power any day. Thirdly, surrender that thing to God and believe by faith that he will give you the power of victory over it. 
And fourthly, stay away from that thing. If the emotions battle with the temptation, the temptation and the emotions are stronger, then the desire not to participate in the sinful act. Therefore, elevate it from an emotional level to your will and say, God, I choose to receive your power. God, I choose to receive your strength. Lord, I am not going to put myself on enchanted ground. You do not cure alcoholism by gargling bourbon. You do not cure a temptation to eat 15 chocolate eclairs by going to smell the chocolate eclairs in the bakery. You do not cure a temptation for drug addiction by going to a party where marijuana is smoked. Stay away from it. Joseph fled from the enticements of Potiphar's wife. There are some things you have to flee from. If you are serious about it, say, Lord, I'm not going to choose to put myself on Satan's ground. I'm going to submit myself to God. I'm going to resist the devil. James chapter 4, verse 7 and 8 says, Therefore submit to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Open your heart to Jesus. Give to him the temptations that have been troubling you, and find victory in Christ today.